Good morning and welcome to worship on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning, the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. I am Pastor Scott Mims and we are here live at uh, Good Shepherd uh, Lutheran Church in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, so, so glad that you are joining us here this morning. Uh, I actually have no announcements uh, to share, so I invite you to join us as we enter into worship uh, through our confession and absolution. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. People of God, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hear these words of grace. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. I invite you to sing with us our opening hymn today, All Are Welcome.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Generous and loving God, your Son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Give us a share of your Spirit, and in all we do empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Numbers chapter 11. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them, that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom, as a nurse carries a sucking child? to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? For they come weeping to me and say, Give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. 
If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once, if I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting, and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered seventy elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the seventy elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told, told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, said of his chosen men, one of his chosen men said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to them, are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 19 is read responsibly. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More, more to be desired our day than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the home. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The second reading is from James, chapter 5. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? they should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who commits committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human, human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back to another, brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. According to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John said to Jesus, 
Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm never dies, and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and be at peace with one another. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So I want to begin this morning with a question. What makes the church the church? What makes a church a healthy church, a, a great church, a, a faithful church? Naturally, different people give different answers to such questions. For some folks, the emphasis falls on inspiring worship and excellent music and strong preaching. For others, on biblical teaching, bold witnessing, and compassionate outreach. Still for others, I suspect it may be the sense of belonging that they experience, the kinds of programs that are offered, the warmth, the care that they receive. What makes the church the church? I believe that it's worth thinking about such questions, especially as we encounter one such vision of being church together in James this morning. So for the past four weeks, we have been reading through the letter of James as our second reading. As you may recall, James offers a very practical and sometimes a very pointed exploration of what it means to be people together in faith, a church. Today, for instance, we come to what is essentially the wrapping up section of his letter, where we discover that whatever the church is, it should be a people who boldly pray for one another. Listen again to what James has to say. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Prayer is a powerful thing. Prayer is a powerful thing, especially when it comes to what is both our privilege and our calling, our Christian duty, if you will, to pray for one another. And yet, should we expect the dramatic things to happen for those for whom we pray? Should we look for the kinds of healing and forgiveness that James seems to take for granted? 
I believe the answer to those questions is most certainly yes, we should. Although I hasten to add that I would also include the efforts of doctors and nurses and counselors and psychologists and physical therapists and nursing assistants and researchers and, and really the work of all the wonderful amazing technologies that we have discovered and developed, that I would include all of these things as well as a part and parcel of God's work healing in our lives. And I want to make that point because given the current state of things in our nation these days, where some seem to want to pit faith against science, Jesus against vaccines even, it needs to be said that such an either-or approach is a false position. Do we truly believe that God is a God of all truth and knowledge? Do we truly believe that the capabilities and talents and skills that we possess are gifts to us from God? That God has known us while we were still in the womb? That God knit us together and formed us and shaped us? If so, then let us give thanks and praise to God who by his grace has empowered people to use these same talents and abilities to increase our knowledge and understanding. And let us bless God for allowing us to live in an age in which the fruits of science and scientific discovery allow options that earlier generations could not have even imagined. And let us also both give thanks and gratitude and support to those who work as healers among us especially right now. I was disheartened to read earlier this week in the paper of how much trouble many of our medical professionals are dealing with, how much ugliness. Certainly they need our understanding and our help and our prayers for their own continued ability, their compassion and strength in this time. So let us give thanks for all that God has and continues to do through the fruits of scientific knowledge and medical discovery. And yet at the very same time, at the very same time, let us also be faithful and bold in praying for God to bring the fullness of healing to those whom we love and to ourselves as well. Not only that, let us dare, let us dare to believe that God will act that God will act in powerful ways. This, you see, is the essence of what James teaches us about being the church together today. For James holds together both this mutuality of prayer and caring with the expectation that when we pray, God will act. James encourages us to stretch ourselves in faith, prayerfully holding onto all God's gifts of healing, both the gifts of modern-day medicine and the gifts of God's gracious power. So how might we do this? How might we live as bold and faithful in our prayers as James calls us to be? Well, I believe we can start by realizing that it is God's desire that we know wholeness and healing. The basic message of Christianity is that Jesus saves. Jesus saves, but not just in terms of the spiritual aspects of our lives as we so often think. For you see, when the earliest Christians spoke of salvation, they thought not only of Jesus saving souls, but also of his power to heal, to bring wholeness to the whole person. We witness this, don't we? in Jesus' own earthly ministry, a ministry that is filled with his healing of people. What's more, Jesus empowered his disciples to do the same. For example, in Mark 6, we read that as part of their, their ministry, their preaching trip among the villages of Galilee, Jesus sent the disciples out and they cast out many demons and they anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Later in the book of Acts, we see the Lord healing people in and through the ministry of the early church. And Paul, who also mentions healing in his letters, lifts up as one of the gifts of God. 
one of the gifts of the Spirit, this, this gift of healing and wholeness that comes. Indeed, it is said that many people became Christians not because of particular doctrines, but because they encountered the power of God at work in their lives. In the healings that they witnessed, it was clear that Jesus saved. And Jesus still saves in the fullness of all that means. Jesus still saves with healing being a part of his presence in our lives. Yet, could it be that sometimes our prayers go unanswered because they are never spoken in the first place? Or when they are, that we really don't expect that much to happen? Think of the following analogy. You're at home at night. It's dark. Everything is dark, right? You go into your bedroom and you flip on the light switch and nothing happens. Do you say to yourself, hmm, that just goes to show that all that stuff about electricity is just that. A bunch of stuff. I bet you don't. I bet you go looking for the reason your lights didn't come on. Maybe a breaker tripped, or maybe the power's out in the neighborhood, or maybe you forgot to pay your bill or something, right? My point is that for most of us, for most of our lives, and yes, yes, I know that some of you remember a time way back before electricity, but for most of us, I would say, we've taken it for granted that electricity is real. The fact that you are watching me this morning online is a testimony to the realness of electricity, right? We can't hear it, we can't smell it, taste it, or feel it apart from an accident, but we've seen it in action. We trust that it will work. I mean, for some of us, electricity is what? Our constant companion through the day, isn't it? So too, James reminds us the power of God is real and at work. God's power is real and at work in our lives, especially as that power is made effective through faithful and faith-filled prayer. What we need, perhaps, is to dare to flip the switch. That is, to put our prayers for one another into action. Now, it is true, of course, that not everyone we pray for will be miraculously, instantaneously healed in a way in which we would like. Again, sometimes the healing that God works gives, uh, takes time. And sometimes the deeper healing that is accomplished is the kind that we cannot immediately see. And it is also true that none of us can avoid death. And that at some point, perhaps, it is better to, to help a person prepare for the next chapter rather than to pray for their healing. However, these things should not discourage us from praying for healing. As we heard in James from last Sunday's second lesson, you do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not ask. Certainly, if we pray for no one, then no one will be healed, not at least in the ways that James seems to take for granted. But if we pray for everyone, some will be healed. Some will be healed, and what's more, all for whom we pray for will be blessed. So then, beloved in Christ, let us dare to be diligent and bold and faithful in our prayers for and with one another in our worship, in our small groups, in our daily time with the Lord, let us not only hold one another up in prayer, but let us, let us let our own needs, our own troubles, our own hopes and dreams be made known to those in our community of faith, that we too may be born on the stretchers of their prayer. For indeed, as James reminds us again this morning about being church together, the prayers of the righteous are powerful, powerful, and effective. Amen. Thanks be to God.
Living together in trust and hope, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we pause for this time of offering, we are so very grateful for those whose support makes our ministry and the work of God here possible at Good Shepherd. Thank you so very much for all that you give to us. Let us pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, for those in need, and all of God's creation. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, we praise you this day for the gift of our lives and for all your abundant blessings. Open our eyes that we may see your presence and power among us. Protect us from all that causes us to stumble in sin and lead our wandering hearts back to you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Most merciful God, as wars, insurrections, and natural disasters surround us, we pray that you would pour out your healing and peace upon our world. We are especially mindful of the violence which continues to destroy lives and livelihoods, and of those who are struggling just to survive. We pray today especially for the peoples of Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, Ethiopia, and Haiti, and for all who struggle to live as refugees. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Gracious Savior, help us to awake to your call to faith and mission. We set before you the fears of our hearts, fears about our future, fears for those whom we love, fears about the economy, fears about our safety, fear of the unknown. We bring to you as well our anger, our prejudices, and our lack of love for those around us. Lord, we lay them before you the only one who can bring us the peace that overcomes our worries and anxieties. Help us to trust that you are with us always. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Lord of love, we mourn today the violence that rages in our communities. We pray that you would protect students 
teachers and school personnel from violence in our schools, and comfort those who have so recently been confronted in our communities with the threats of gun violence. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy God, come to the aid of those whose lives are filled with a need for healing. Lift up those who mourn, those who are depressed, those who are lonely. Encourage those who are battling addictions, disease, and temptation. Especially we pray today, Lord, for Naomi and Judy, for Margaret and Margaret, for Milt, Rodney, for Steve, Cindy, Carol, Fran, Dorothy, Betty, Kathy, Mary, Jake, Dottie, Beverly, Ray, and their caregivers. Lord, we lift up to you today all who work as healers in our community, our doctors and nurses and CNAs, our counselors and social workers, therapists, and any who labor to bring wholeness and healing into the lives of others. We also pray, O oh Lord, for our military and their families, and for all those whom we lift before you now, silently or aloud. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of comfort and hope, we pray that you would surround those who are grieving and fill them with the blessed assurance that one day their mourning will be turned into dancing and their grieving into gladness. Bring us all at length, we pray, with our blessed dead to the joy of your heavenly realm. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, gracious God, we do commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life. To a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Let us sing together our final hymn. Found on page 11. <laughs> 